Welcome everyone to our Angels Rest annual blessing in this incredible canyon. I'm not sure who ordered the weather, but thank you. Whoever you are, came through really well. Today we wanna to talk about connectivity, love, all the things that bring us together. I can't think of anything actually more impressive and heartwarming than to be surrounded by like-minded individuals who have loved animals across species, age, fur, feathered, slithery, two-legged, three-legged, whatever you got. You loved them and you continue to love them because that love lives on, right? You carry that love forward, and that's why you're here today. And I want to welcome to our folks at home. Uh, we have lit, we've lit, lit, I don't know where I'm from. <laughs> we lit candles over here on the table. Uh, and it, please feel free to get up and light a candle in memory of one of your loved ones. And we're inviting folks at home to please uh, light a candle in honor of your I, I want to call it bye for now, right? Because we know and we all believe that at some point we will be reunited with the ones we've said goodbye to. Some of us are going to have some crazy good times when that happens. And I think about what binds us, what connects us between heart, mind, and spirit, and that pathway of love that flows through all of us. Love is an amazing thing can make us feel really good and can make us feel really crappy when it goes away. But remind yourself always that love actually never goes away. And that love is, it's always there inside your heart. And grief is that price we pay for love. And I want to also say a little bit more about love because this seems to be the theme for this entire week of wild connections. And it must be all the spirituality and all the beauty that you guys bring. But there's a person in my life who's so very important to me. She's one of our co-founders, but she's also my friend. And when I'm feeling particularly salty as I can be, we all can be, come on. You know you can. She reminds me that there's a better way or an enlightened path sometimes to take and to look at things a little bit differently, to turn them around just a little bit so that the light can shine on that thought. Because just as I'm going down the rabbit hole of, well, I don't know what they were thinking. <laughs> she says, maybe they weren't thinking about you at all. <laughs> and I'm like, what? <laughs> But I'm talking about Anne Mejia. Anne has been the driving force of Angel's Rest and the development of how we care for and remember our beloved pets and how we care for ourselves through that time of loss and rejuvenation. An amazing thing about people, we go back in and we love again even though we know our hearts are sure to be broken. But the beauty is the fact that we know people who share that feeling. We know that we're surrounded by people who will actually lift us up, even in our darkest times. And as Anne continues to be our guiding force on all things love and lovely, I would like to say, Thank you. You're precious. And you're precious to me. Ladies and gentlemen, Anne Mejia. So she set me up to cry already. <laughs> My evil plan. That was evil. Um, 
Why are we here? Why are we here now? And why are we here together to change the world around us? Because we have been touched by angels. Regardless of our faith, our religion, our background, our politics, anything that has in any way made us different from each other, these little quirky angels with their quirky personalities bring us together. They've touched our lives in ways that cannot be expressed in words. They've changed us forever, deep within, and made us better people by their need for us, by their undiminished love, by them being uncorrupted by all the things they've been dealt with in their lives, by their pure innocence, they have transformed us. By their need for us, they have brought out a deeper love in our lives than we knew was possible. And when they depart, as Patty said, that love never goes. It may transform and be felt in different ways, but that is there forever. And that's why we are here today. And that's why we want to make a difference in this world for these special little angels who depend on us. And that is why we created Angels Rest. Our caregivers right here will tell you stories about angels that have changed their lives. They have changed the lives of those little beings that they've cared for. They've given their hearts to those little beings, just as we have to the ones in our own personal lives. For that reason, and for the love and cherishing of these beings, these little angels, feathers, legs, slithering, riding in pastures, whatever animal that might be, cat, dog, horse, squirrel, mouse, rabbit, wild animals, pigs. We loved them all, cared for them all, and placed them with that cherishing, and we call it tucking in. We tuck them in at Angel's Rest. I want to share a story with you. Many years ago, when we were just in the beginning stages of Angel's Rest, a lovely couple from San Francisco reached out and said, we have, a, we have a beautiful headstone that we've created for our cat, Zipporah. Can we bring it? And I said, of course. You may have seen it at Angel's Rest. It's very big, very elegant, and it's for Princess Zipporah, the Princess of Calico. When we did that tucking in of Zipporah, they put little rocks on the headstone. And I said, what is the purpose of the rocks? Is that a tradition? And they said, yes, it's a Jewish tradition. That instead of flowers and other things that will just diminish, we place rocks that are there forever, which represents our love that is there forever. So you will see throughout Angel's Rest, piles and piles of rocks on all these little placements where they've been tucked in because that was shared with others and others wanted to do the same. We share our best intentions with each other to transform and change the lives of these animals. And we do the same in their passing. We share in the cherishing of their passing. And that's what we're doing today. At Angel's Rest, we have wind chimes. And it can be a very quiet place and time when we're doing a tucking in. You don't see a leaf shaking here at all. And 
It could be the very same at angel's rest when we're doing a tucking in. When we do a tucking in, the chimes start to talk every time. It can be a still day and those chimes talk. So there is a very special reverence that even nature brings when we're tucking in these little guys. And so right now today, we're gonna share that cherishing. We can allow those tears, it's okay. We all feel the same way. That loss is deep, the cherishing is profound, but allow yourself to feel it in the safe place with everyone who feels the same way. And so now I'd like to hand it over to our caregivers. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. That is beautiful. Just even the language around how we, how we tuck our little babies in, right? How beautiful is that? So I have a little, well, a short poem I would like to read by William Blake. To see a world in a grain of sand and a heaven in a wildflower. Hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. As everyone knows that caregivers are near and dear to our hearts, my heart specifically and preciously. I, I work alongside these guys for many, many years and I watch the work that they do and there's, there's people in our organization who are tasked with many different roles, some that involve a lot of vision, right? We have our vision folks over here leading us forward. We have our folks who can see the world in a raindrop. And then we have the people who can bring all that together right in the middle and meld those two precepts, and that's our caregivers. They are specialists. They are the people who day in and day out take care of the animals that come into the sanctuary. No matter how big or how small or whether they have behavioral challenges that have kind of prohibited them from being able to get into a home or they have medical challenges. They work with them day in and day out and we rely on these folks to make sure that they see any small changes so that we, we can help these animals be the best that they can be. For the last three weeks, I've been with the Panluk kitties. We took in 25 kittens that uh, were exposed to panleukopenia, which is a, a, a horrible and mostly fatal disease. Now in most shelters, they would depopulate that group because they wouldn't want that disease to spread. So we reacted very quickly and we took them into our isolation ward. But as you know, we get stretched just like everyone else. So it's a call to all of us to lend a hand and to pitch in. And you lend a hand and you pitch in not knowing what the outcome's going to be. You don't know if you're gonna be really sad at the end of this haul or if you're gonna be really happy. All you can do is try. And in trying, what you find is a lot of success because that success lives inside of the trying, inside of the doing, inside of the caring. And by looking at these kittens, every single day was able to see minute changes that we were able to adjust their medicines and relay that to the medical team so that we had out of 25, 26, we had 25 who lived and went on to Cat World. Is that crazy? And you get to know every single one of them and then you think, oh my God, had we not stepped in, you wouldn't be here today, you crazy little kitten. 
there was one in particular named Phoenix that literally every time I opened the kennel door, he jumped out onto me <laughs> and held on for dear life. But the reason I'm telling you this is in the midst of all of this, there was a dog named Mary. And Mary came in from the Navajo Nation's reservation and they asked for help with this little girl. And she was a little shepherd mix and she had parvo. But on top of parvo, she had two tick-borne diseases. And she was, she was really at her end. Like I, I, I would go in there and just lean into her cage and hold her paw and it was cold. And she could barely look at me or anyone. And day after day, I would go in there, and she was a little bit brighter. And it was not me. It was our medical team. And the tenacity and the, 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 and the gift of being able to get the right medic medications in the right order and the dedication of the staff and the caregivers who, who put their time into telling her it's going to be worth it going to be worth it when you get to the other side of this. And every day I'd go in there and I'd peek in that room and she was still there. And that was amazing to me. But the thing that was the most amazing was to be in this company of people who are so dedicated that I heard throughout the entire hospital, we got a tail thump. Just the very smallest little thing, but it meant so much to everyone who was there marching through this with Mary. And I started crying because I'm in the clinic and I hear all across the clinic, got a tail thump, got a tail thump, got a tail thump, got a tail thump, all the way through the clinic. And then I was gone for a couple of days and I came back and I was scared to ask, but I was like, nope, you can't be scared. You can't be afraid and you can't be a wimp because after all, it's Mary who's going through this, not you. And I stuck my head in there and she was sitting up and she's been eating and she's off of her IV fluids. And to me, that's the testimony of the work that these folks do. That's why I am in awe of them every day. Because not only do they have their own animals at home that they have to give to, and, 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 and their animals, I'm sure, do some good giving back to them at night, telling them it's okay, right? But it's the fact that they come in day in and day out, and they are the ones who give us the information that we need to keep these guys progressing and doing better. Now, FYI, Mary's not completely out of the woods. But I'll tell you what, she's off to a really good start. So I want to introduce our first caregiver that's coming up here, and that's Miss Lauren with Wild Friends. And she taught me a whole lot about chickens. <laughs> Come on up, Ms. Lauren. Hi, so my name is Lauren and I work at Wild Friends. So we are our licensed wildlife rehab centers. So we do have all of our rehab patients. Um, but I am going to be talking about, first off, um, some of our ducks that we passed. <laughs> So we had Poseidon and Neptune for the last 12 years. They came in, they had to be rescued. They had fallen off a waterfall and were stuck underneath a dam. So I guess it was quite the rescue. I, it was before my time, so I didn't get to witness it, but I've heard stories. They were bonded brothers and they loved each other dearly and they were always together. So after 12 years, it wasn't a surprise to us that after Poseidon passed, Neptune was not long to follow. And now they are together, I'm sure, across the Rainbow Bridge. And we also had this little girl come in. So this is a short-tailed possum. Her name was Darla. So this is a strange animal for us to get in at Wild Friends. Uh, these guys are part of the illegal pet trade. So she was surrendered, and she's not supposed to be allowed in Utah. So they brought her to us, and she was already at the end of her life. So we did not have her for very long but I cherished every minute with her because she was such a fun little being. 
Um, she doesn't look like a possum. She looks like a mouse, but she has a little possum tail and she had the little possum hands when she was eating. She was so cute and she would love to just sit into, if you had a pocket or a hoodie, she would just sit with you all day long and she was super, super fun. So we're glad that we at least gave her a safe place to spend her last few months. And then Shu, um, this one's gonna hit a little bit harder because we just lost Shu. So Shu was one of our educational ambassadors and she was like the face of our owls. She is a great horn owl and she was the one that always greeted the visitors and volunteers and was the most visible. She waited for people, was at front and center of her cage every day while Nunu and Tally kind of hang back and hide from people. She was also Nunu's best friend and uh, no, Nunu is 25 years old and Shu came in 10 years ago, but we're not sure how old she was. She did come into our rehab center as an injured adult, so we're not sure how old she was. But she was very protective of Nunu and was always with her. So just recently, Shu started having some issues, and we realized that she had severe cataracts in both eyes and wasn't able to find her food. So we had to make the hard decision. And with these education ambassadors, these are animals that you work with every day on programs and stuff, it's a lot like losing a coworker. It's a very strange feeling, but she will, she will be missed. Her, she's absolutely beautiful, and I'm gonna, I miss all the visitors saying, ooh, ah, when they see her, because <laughs> she was so gorgeous. But these are our, our beautiful babies that we lost this year, and thank you so much for, for listening. Hello. My name is Melissa. I work in Parrot Garden. Can you guys hear me all right? Cool. So this big guy right here, this is Kaki. He's a sulfur-crested cockatoo. Um, Kaki was actually once a free-flying bird in Australia. Um, we don't have an exact age on him. You can't really age a bird. He's not, he wasn't super young and he wasn't super old. Um, these guys can live to be 80 or more. Um, he was captured from the wild in 1982 and flown across the world to become a pet. Um, for 30 years, he lived with a family who loved him dearly, but they didn't know all the things that cockatoos needed to be happy. Um, in his first home, he was never let out of his cage. They were too intimidated by his size. Um, once his family passed away, he ended up in a foster home, and that foster um, left his door open. Um, all the time and he just chose never to come out because he was so used to being confined he wasn't comfortable anymore. Um, in 2010 he came to Best Friends um, and he lived in a large aviary for the rest of his time with us. Um, over the years he befriended many other cockatoos, even shared an aviary with a Major Mitchell's cockatoo named Wild Bill, some of you guys might remember him, um, who shared a similar story to his. Um, but in Cocky's last few years with us um, he did learn how to trust us um, and he even stepped up on his favorite caregiver's arm and let her give him head scratches. Um, if you've ever taken a tour of Pear Garden anytime since 2010, um, you have likely met Kaki. Um, he loved to show off. Um, when the tour would come around to his aviary, he got a kick out of um, screaming as loud as he could. Um, it would make your ears start to ring. Um, and uh, he would watch with glee absolutely as every single person on the tour would jump back in surprise and hold their ears. Um, Parrot Garden will never feel the same without his goofy personality. Um, it still feels weird that he's gone. Um, but we do still hear a signature scream from time to time. We have a couple longer term resident cockatoos, Nikki and Cyrano, who uh, learned how to mimic that scream. So can still hear it. <laughs> um, so that's cocky. Next up, we have, so on the left, the red bird, that's Kaimi. On the right, um, that's her mate, Laquita, who we lost a couple years ago. Um, but Kaimi, um, she's a green wing macaw. Um, she spent the first couple years of her life in the early 90s living on a resort on the big island of Hawaii. Um, she was then moved to the mainland U.S. and lived with a family for about 20 years um, before coming to us. Her, her bonded mate, Laquita, and her buddy, Willie, who has also since passed, came to Best Friends together in 2012. Um, even though Kaimi was the second largest species of parrot, 
she was quite large. Um, she was actually one of our most gentle of all of our parrots. Um, we would step her up bare armed. We would even put her on small kids that had a steady arm. Um, she's a volunteer favorite, for sure. Um, she loved to bob her head and dance, regardless if there was any music playing. Um, and you knew you were a part of Kaimi's inner circle if she made clicking noises at you, those are her kisses, um, or if she said uh, aloha. You had to work really hard to get her to say her aloha. <laughs> it always made my day. Um, but yeah, when we got our new headquarters building, when that opened in 2017, we started to let Kaimi and Laquita, you know, you can never say one name, it was always both of them. Um, we would close all of the doors to all of our rooms and we would let them wander the hallways and you just hear them mimicking a human laugh just wandering through and we'd peek outside at them, make sure they weren't getting into too many things they weren't supposed to, but they loved it so much. Um, yeah, we, we missed them. Kaimi and Quita. And then next up. So she's a little hard to see, um, but on the left is Zena. Um, she's the one that passed away. On the right is her long-term partner, Zeus. Zeus and Zena. Um, so Zena and her partner, Zeus. Zena and Zeus are our Congo African greys. Um, arguably one of the most intelligent of all parrot species by far. Um, these two are also taken from the wild for the pet trade sometime in the mid 80s. They were brought over to become breeder birds. Um, they found their way um, to best friends in 2006 and lived in a large aviary with many other African greys over the years. Um, African greys are well known for their mimicking ability. They can perfectly mimic literally any type of sound, electronic noises, human voices. Um, they can learn how to use words in context, form their own sentences. Um, they're incredibly intelligent little beings. Um, over the years, um, Zena helped educate countless numbers of volunteers and visitors on the importance of adopting and the consequences shopping can have. Um, though Zena never learned how to mimic human speech, actually she probably likely chose just never to learn. <laughs> they really are um, that smart. Um, she enjoyed whistling with us um, and silently judging us from a distance. Um, <laughs> we don't know how old Zena was when she passed. She was at least in her 40s, um, but their species can live to be 60s or more. Um, this particular um, photo, um, I don't know if you can really tell, Zena's holding a treat that looks like it's larger than her head, and then her partner Zeus on the right is just pouting because he wanted it instead. But yeah, those are some of our little guys. You know, it's always really bittersweet when our birds pass away, you know, we miss them, but we are really, really happy that they get to be flying freely. Thank you. Hello, my name is Megan and I work at the Bunny House. Uh, first, I'm gonna tell you guys about Ernie and Nora. If you guys have worked in the Bunny House, you guys definitely have seen these guys. They were senior bunnies that lived their entire lives at the sanctuary. <clears throat> both of their lives did start out pretty rough from where they came from. They were both found on the streets, most likely abandoned. Um, white bunnies with red eyes are considered frightening to most people, so they didn't have much of a chance where they were found. They were both brought to best friends and they arrived three months apart. Um, Ernie was most likely attacked by another animal. He had puncture wounds all over his body. And then Nora was most likely hit by a car. Uh, she was dragging her back end when they rescued her. <clears throat> when they met each other, they bonded within a week. And for bunnies, that's pretty quick. I don't know if you guys have ever tried to bond a bunny, but it's not an easy process. So they definitely very much loved each other and knew that they could comfort each other through what they've been through in their past. Uh, they spent the rest of their lives at their sanctuary and they were not adopted. Like I said, it is difficult to adopt out bunnies with red eyes. They were very loved by their caregivers and of course all of the volunteers and had a lot of sponsors. Um, <clears throat> they were crossed on um, the grass at the bunny house where we do hoppy time and they were crossed together 
And um, it was very peaceful and beautiful to see them on the grass together. They were in a ray of sunshine, and now they're just having an eternal hoppy time together, and they're still on that grass out there. Next, I'd like to tell you guys about Ale. Ale is a tripod that we had. She only had three legs because she had um, an injury when she was younger. She was actually bitten by a brown recluse spider, and they had to amputate the leg. They weren't able to save it. Uh, but that did not slow down Ale at all. Um, Ale was actually the, fun, the fastest bunny uh, whenever we did hoppy time. You, you could not tell that that bunny had three legs. It basically looked like she was like floating, like she was so fast. She was amazing. She also had the most beautiful long eyelashes and every girl wanted to have them. <laughs> um, at first, she definitely did not like her caregivers. She was pretty reluctant, but once she realized the care we were providing for her, uh, she was very grateful. For example, she loved to have her ears cleaned because she couldn't get to it, obviously, because she was missing a leg. So she was very grateful for us in the end. Um, and she was a sweet spirit. And I was able to work with all of these bunnies, even though I'm fairly new at the bunny house. So I'm very grateful to work with these guys. Thank you. Hello. I'm very soft-spoken, I'll try. <laughs> I'm Rosalie, I'm from Horse Haven, Piggy Paradise. We lost one pig this year, Tobias. Tobias came to Best Friends about 2011, and originally he was bought as a teacup pig. Who's done their homework? What's my next sentence? <laughs> he got too big, thank you. He was adopted out about 2015, came back 2019. Tobias was very, very intelligent, even for a pig who are already a pretty intelligent species. Um, he was also incredibly introverted, um, one of the most introverted pigs I've ever met. But he could be funny sometimes, not always. He was a pretty serious pig, but sometimes he could be pretty funny. I would like when he would kind of take up two beds, two of the dog beds, and I would call him a bed hog, obviously. <laughs> um, but he, in his younger years, he loved to, you know, command, sit, shake for treats. He was really a really intelligent guy. He was pretty picky throughout his years uh, with his herd mates, so it would take a while to introduce him to pigs. And he got older. He... Um, passed away in May, this May, he had um, infected um, teeth or tusks and he was a pretty quiet guy, but he did get to spend his last year with another very serious introvert, Molly. So that was a pretty good pairing. Um, when he would come out of his shell, what he would mainly do, he loved to clicker train, target train, but he also loved to play in his pool, his little swimming pool and go dunking for almonds that we would toss in there and um, he would love to also blow bubbles in there. You gotta love that. And he wasn't a big cuddle bug, but he loved us and we loved him. We had him for a really long time. And he was just one of our stoic, introverted guys. And he will be greatly missed. So thank you guys for all, everybody who ever came and visited him and worked with him. He was a good guy. <laughs> My name is Karen. I'm a local volunteer in Horse Haven and I'm often with senior horses. We lost touch this past September 4th at age 36. She was a beautiful golden Arabian mare and former champion Western pleasure riding horse who came to best friends in 2022. Her full name was Touch of Gold. One. Touch soon joined Helen, the blind horse, and Snickers, the half-blind pony, in their paddock near the covered arena. She took the lead on regular walks with volunteers around Horse Haven. Touch also liked going solo into the arena. Another photo for you. This is Touch. 
After a few minutes in the arena, she would paw the ground, circle, drop and roll, and then get up and give the biggest shake and snort and blow out for minutes. She loved to look at all the horses and people as she wandered around, inspecting everything, including an older horse, an older horse trailer. Whoops, I got the wrong one here. An older horse trailer that was open to the arena. In fact, she'd walk into it on her own, trailing herself, as if reliving her glory days, ready to head off to her next adventure. <sighs> Happy trails across the Rainbow Bridge, my friend. Hi everyone, my name is Jess and I work in Dogtown and I'd like to talk about a few dogs that have crossed this year. In fact, in the last two months, I've lost four really great friends um, that I've cared for over the years. So the first one I'd like to talk about is Cliff. Cliff came to us from Long Island, New York. I used to call him Strong Island. Um, he came from the Brookhaven Animal Shelter there. Uh, they really adored him there and they advocated for him to come to Best Friends when he was getting overlooked there. He ended up in their care because he supposedly bit or tore the clothing of a delivery person, but we never really saw anything like that from Cliff. He was so people oriented. He loved people very much and he ended up deciding that he wanted to be the only dog because he loved people so much. Um, he had some play dates and things like that, but he preferred to live alone. He had a lot of medical challenges throughout the years here, and uh, some of them were skin-related, skin infections, allergies. He ate a special diet, um, things like that. He had a lot of different medical challenges that his caregivers, um, we all faced with you know, just took it in stride and advocated the best we could for Cliff with our medical team uh, supporting us. And uh, one of my favorite memories of Cliff, he, he lived in admissions for quite a long time. Uh, that's not really how admissions works, but he didn't really have anywhere else to live. And if he lived on sand, his skin got worse. Um, towards the end of his life, he had his own run um, at Old Friends where he lived and was able to be on sand. But in admissions, he couldn't have any toys or blankets because he was known to ingest things and we have to protect the dogs from their poor choices sometimes. So I had finally gathered four very, very heavy duty toys. And we've all seen the very heavy duty toys get torn up anyway, but I got the best ones I could find and we made a little toy box for Cliff that he could have only if he was supervised. So it started out like that. Um, and there were very strict instructions like Cliff's toy box with supervision only. Um, and he progressed and progressed and then he was allowed to have those super sturdy toys, you know, while, while we were not there without supervision. But giving him those toys the first time, the first week he had the supervised toolbox was like, toy box was one of my like favorite times with him. He also loved golf cart rides very much, much more than walking. Um, he loved car rides too, but he used to get a medical bath um, multiple times a week. And it was about from me to that giant tree back there where the bath took place and I had to use the golf cart because he would not walk there. <laughs> he was perfectly behaved for the bath, but he would not walk to the bath. So we had to use the golf cart. Uh, but Cliff was a sweetheart. He stole many hearts. His caregivers at Old Friends, I know, still miss him greatly. We all miss him. He had a very big personality. In fact, just, just yesterday, a caregiver asked me, I, I don't know if they were thinking of the blessing coming up or why they even asked me this, but they said, what's the word that you think of when you think of Cliff? And I said, gregarious. It's a fancy word for a fancy guy, but he also has such a big heart. So... That's Cliff. 
The next dog I'll talk about is Whistler. Um, the photo's not so big, sorry about that. It's in his favorite place. That's why I picked this photo. This is in the Heights Dog Park. Um, he's a beautiful tricolor hound who came to us from Indiana um, many years ago. He lived most of his life here at the sanctuary. It was a really special case. He came to us just as about a one-year-old youngster. He was missing a piece of his brain. Um, he had actually had MRI diagnostics in Indiana, and he was missing a piece of his cerebellum. We don't know if there was some kind of trauma or if um, he was born that way, but it did affect him in some ways. He had some uh, stereotypies that he did, like galloping, um, spinning sometimes. He really liked to be at the front gate, like that was his area, and he wanted to just be there um, and do some of these repetitive behaviors. But uh, with time, he always has loved dogs, so he got to live with dogs here. But with time and progress with our medical team, we were able to get him on track and get him on some medications that helped with his neurological deficits and really give him an amazing quality of life. So just to give you an idea, I don't always like to sh share all the bites a dog has had. <laughs> I don't think that you have to live and die by your bites, but this dog had a lot of bites in his early years here. And um, he came so far that he was volunteer friendly for like the last three years of his life. He got to go out with people. We even started taking him on little outings. Like he got to come up here to Angel's Landing. He got to visit one of his most favorite people at the Welcome Center. Uh, he was a gem for medical handling for the most part of his life. He, he always knew that if, if, if his friends were handling him, we were trying to help him. But this is an example. He's an amazing example of like what we can do here because um, he, again, was a bit unpredictable in his early days. And he kind of had a reputation. And as he aged and as we worked with him um, in conjunction with some medications that he took, we were able to give him like the best life for him. Um, so I'm just really proud of him and, and all the people who worked with him throughout his life because we really were his family and we gave him a home here. So that's Whistler. Yara is a beautiful girl. Uh, she was about 11 years old when she passed. She came to us from Best Friends Los Angeles. Uh, she loved being with people so much that she had some separation anxiety and uh, she just always wanted to be with people. Uh, aside from being with people, she loved uh, cozy beds. And sometimes you give a dog a cozy bed in an exciting environment like Dogtown, and they'll shred it up. But she cherished her cozy bed. She always loved it. She loved golf cart rides and car rides. She didn't always want to go for walks. She preferred to hang out with people. Uh, Yara, one time... Learn. She lived here in Dogtown for several years and never escaped anything. Uh, and then one day she learned to escape <laughs> and she realized she could do it and she became an expert. <laughs> so we tried four different times to have her, um, you know, live securely. And each time we got a radio call, Angels, Yara's trying to escape again. So we had to go get her <laughs> and uh, maintenance helped us build something pretty foolproof and it kept her contained, but what we did, and it's nice that we have the time and the ability to, we moved her into that run slowly, and we would spend time with her in that run because that's all she—that's what she really wanted. So we helped her see that that run was a safe place. Um, but Yara got really sick really quickly, was diagnosed with diabetes. We had no idea she had diabetes. Um, there were some many complications, um, but she was a real special dog and. Um, her presence definitely up at Angels is really missed. And then we have Ricky, who also lived at Angels. So the dogs that live up at Angels Lodges, they live alone. They prefer to live by themselves. Uh, Ricky came to us from Best Friends Los Angeles as well. And um, he had a small but very special group of friends. It, it took some work to become Ricky's friend. And he had a, a lot of like parameters, I guess, to be his friend. He didn't want people touching him very much. He wanted to get leashed up a certain way. Um, he loved going for car rides, but he, you know, just wanted to do his own thing and sniff out the window. Um, he loved going for hikes. He was a really special dog who was always running around in his yard with a toy in his mouth. The way to his heart was like through toys and maybe food, but 
really toys, giving him a new toy was one of my most enjoyable things as his caregiver because he would just show it off to all the dogs and all the people. And he lived on the end, like where we would pass in our cars and on golf carts. And every time people would pass, he would be like, hey, check me out. I have my new toy <laughs> uh, and just show them off. He probably had the most toys in his run of any dog I've known here. Um, so that's Ricky. Uh, really special guy. And lastly, um, I just want to talk about Camille for um, a minute because sometimes um, many of the dogs I showed you and the dogs that Tom's going to talk about, we've known for a long time. Sometimes the hardest losses can be dogs that you barely had a chance to know because you didn't have a chance to help them. Um, so this is Camille, and she kind of represents that for me this year. Uh, she came to us from Navajo Nation Animal Control. She had a giant tumor on her front leg. Uh, it was larger than a grapefruit, just to give you an idea. Um, we thought, oh, cool, we'll get her here. We'll amputate her leg, and she'll be fine. Um, and we thought she was, you know, maybe... We didn't know for sure her age, but a guesstimate of like older than two, but not quite a senior. Uh, unfortunately, when we had a, a visiting vet specialist here that was going to amputate her leg, which we were really grateful for because we thought that would give her the best chance. Um, before the amputation, they found that um, her lungs were full of cancer. Um, so we couldn't amputate her leg. Um, we patched her up as best we could um, and tried to give her a quality of life for a little bit. Um, but it didn't go the way we hoped at all. And as with her lungs full of cancer, she basically got to live with us for a week um, and get spoiled and loved and lots of food and lots of snacks and all the best comforts. Um, but then we had to let her go. Um, and I just wish she could have been with us just a little bit longer. So thank you. My name's Tom, I'm a caregiver in Dogtown. I'd like to say just a few brief words about four dogs uh, that we lost this year in Dogtown. First one, I don't know how well you guys can see these photos up here. This is Gunner. Gunner was a German short-haired pointer. Uh, really handsome, beautiful dog. Gunner came to us several years ago from our Salt Lake City facility. And in Salt Lake City, he had been adopted into a home and unfortunately um, occurred, uh, I think it was two bite incidents in that home. We think mainly the, the, the one, well, I will say, I saw pictures of the one, the results of the one bite incident, and it was pretty serious. Um, we think that what happened in that incident was that Gunner was focused on something of high value, could have been a squirrel, could have been a, a, anything that would have been high value, and somebody startled him from behind, and he just turned around and redirected on that person. That was a, a fairly serious incident. So Gunner came to Dogtown several years ago, and um, I was his caregiver for uh, a couple of those years. Um, my favorite memories of Gunner involve water. Gunner loved water. He would love to swim in the pool at the dog park, and he would put his whole body in there and just swim around. Uh, we also put one of these uh, kiddie pools in, Walmart, in, uh, in, in Gunner's Run, the kind that you can buy at Walmart. And uh, as soon as we would clean that thing, five minutes later, he would have tracked dirt into it, and it became a brown mess of mud fairly quickly. We did that day after day, and Gunner just loved dirtying up his clean pool. Um, also, Gunner loved to stick his front feet in his water bucket. So go figure, he would just stand in his water bucket. Uh, this is a dog who truly adored being in the water. Towards the end, um, Gunner's health was failing. Uh, he had some heart issues, some respiratory problems. He crossed the bridge peacefully in his sleep overnight, which is kind of a, um, there's good and bad to that. We, we know that he didn't suffer, but it's really hard for the caregiver who comes in in the morning and finds that. So um, blessings to Gunner for, for sharing his life with us in Dogtown. Now this beautiful girl is CB. We named her after two letters in the alphabet, C and B. <laughs> really creative of us. CB uh, came to us at two years old, and I was uh, one of CB's first caregivers. To say that she was a wild child back in those days would be a massive understatement. 
this dog would jump all over you. She had no impulse control, no manners whatsoever. Um, but she was extraordinarily extroverted. And so we matched CB up with an introverted little white pity named Amina. And we often do this in Dogtown where an extroverted dog can help an introverted dog. Uh, but as it turns out, CB was teaching Amina a bunch of bad habits and not good habits. So we separated the two of them and CB went to live in a different area of Dogtown. I consider myself fortunate that I stayed in touch with her over her years in Dogtown. She remembered me uh, from her original uh, stay with me in my area of Dogtown. And uh, back in the early years too, CB was, let me say, so wild that she needed to be a staff only dog. This is a designation where a dog is not quite ready to interact with visitors and volunteers. It's not safe for everybody, including the dog. So she didn't meet very many people back in those early days when she was young and wild. But over time, um, as she lived in Dogtown and matured and progressed with her behaviors, um, she was able to interact with more savvy volunteers. She could go on car rides and outings with them. So her life expanded. Her her horizons expanded. She got to do more and more activities. And um, towards the end, she was 12 years old when she crossed. Uh, she uh, had a very loyal fan club. She had a, a collection of caregivers who had adored her over the years. And I consider myself fortunate to be one of those. So that's CB. This little guy is Barley. Barley, I hope you can see this photo. Barley was a corgi mix, um, except, and he had the long body to go with it and the pointy ears and the uh, short stubby legs. But Barley was about half the size of that typical corgi that you're picturing in your head. So he was a small little guy. Barley came to us from our Best Friends Los Angeles facility and we were convinced that Barley would gonna be able to live with other dogs. And we were so convinced that we tried him with a, a dog about his size. And after a, a few days of that, Barley uh, clearly told us that he did not want to live with this dog. And so we separated the two of them. And uh, in one of our moves meetings, which are weekly meetings to discuss introducing dogs to each other and moving dogs around to live in other parts of Dogtown, well, I had the idea that um, let's try Barley in a run in the area that I worked in Dogtown. I have two magnificent dogs named Kojak and Marshall. And Kojak had wonderful dog skills. And Marshall was a senior black lab mix who was kind of like that kindly grandfather we've all had in our lives. And Marshall would take dogs under his wing and just tell him it's gonna be okay here. Well, Barley couldn't live with them either. <laughs> so we gave up trying to find Barley dogs to live with. And he was pretty clear that he didn't want to. So uh, Barley lived a good long life here. He was about uh, 12 or 13, I believe, when he crossed here uh, just a, a, a couple, a handful of months ago. Um, he also had some heart issues and some respiratory problems and would cause him to faint. And as those fainting episodes became more frequent, uh, we knew that we needed to help Barley and not let him suffer through those. So that's Barley. And I have one more. This is Buddha. Buddha hanging out the back window of somebody's car. Um, Buddha, Buddha also came to us from our best friend's Los Angeles facility. And he arrived uh, several years ago. Buddha sort of had a reputation that preceded him. I only came to know Buddha in the last two years of his life where I was his caregiver. But I remember hearing about Buddha um, hearing stories about Buddha, hearing on the radio uh, cautions about interacting with Buddha. And so Buddha lived in an office at one point with our training staff. And so I would hear radio calls that say, uh, hey, hey, Glenn, can I go in the office and get this or get a harness or get a training tool? And all, always, always the answer would be, yes, but don't go in the office if you don't know Buddha. Buddha had a tendency to get overstimulated, very humpy. Um, he would grab your clothes, grab your shirt, rip your clothing, grab your forearm in his mouth. And back in those days, he was um, quite an active 
rambunctious, full of life guy. Pretty big, too. Um, while he looks like he has this square jaw and square face of a pity, he was tall and lanky, kind of like a Great Dane would be. So this was a big 70-pound dog, and you don't want that jumping up on you all the time and ripping your shirt off of you. So uh, when I moved to my most recent area in Dogtown, where I work now, Buddha was already there, and I approached him with a little trepidation, and I said, we're going to be friends, aren't we? And it didn't take him long, and we developed a really nice relationship. Um, Buddha calmed down in his later years. He was able to go for walks with volunteers without glomming onto their leg and humping them the whole way around the trail. <laughs> and so <laughs> Buddha, um, Buddha's health took a turn for the worse earlier this year. We noticed that he just wasn't acting right. Um, we asked if he could have some lab work done on his blood. It turns out that he was suffering from anemia. We did get some medical treatment to try to help him, and I'd like to acknowledge our medical staff and the medications and treatments that they allowed us to, um, to work with Buddha on. It did give him probably an extra five months of life, and for that, I'm personally really grateful. But towards the end, um, we knew that Buddha wasn't going to live too much longer, and Buddha, like Gunner, also crossed in his sleep overnight. So peaceful, but also very difficult for the caregiver who comes in in the morning and finds that. Uh, those are the four dogs that I wanted to talk about. Thank you guys for coming to share these stories with us. Thank you, Patty, for the kind words about caregivers. Very much appreciate that. And I think I turn it back over to you, right? So now you know what I'm talking about if you didn't already, right? I want a pool. I want to take a golf cart ride. I want to just be by people. I don't want to be by people. I like other dogs. I hate other dogs. You know what? This is what it's about. It's about listening. It's about not having a one-size-fits-all attitude and approach to how we care for the animals that come to us. And that's what these guys do. And it's that listening. It's that, that paying attention. And whether they're here for five days, five months, five years, we try to listen so that at least whatever circumstance led them to us, they know somebody's listening. They know somebody cares to listen. And then we try to get them home. But in the meantime, this is home between homes. And we do the best we can to listen. And that's where we go back to the, the drop of rain, the great vision. You have to pay attention to the, the little things, but you have to have a vision for where you want these guys to end up. You want them to end up in home. But if you don't end up in a home, well, heck, we'll take you on a golf cart ride, <laughs> right? And you guys make that possible. And you do this in your own home, right? You listen. How many people here are very well trained? Of course you are. <laughs> so, walking through this terrain of grief and loss and companioning with folks and, oh, listening deeply and intently, intensely to the stories that everyone has to tell, it's incredible. Everybody here has a story of how you found one another. How that living, fabulous being came into your life and brought out things in you that you never knew even existed half the time. And how you had voices that you never knew existed at the time. Because we make up voices for our animals. <laughs> We do things with them. We make up words, and they know the word we're talking about. 
And this made me really, I, I don't know, to open my heart to this world of, oh, where does the heart go? Where does the mind go when we are touched so deeply and our lives are so changed and basically these animals become a part of our DNA? There's a part of us that we, the logical brain and the emotional brain, sometimes they have a bit of a tussle. And I had the good fortune of being introduced to a very, very lovely human being. And we together work with folks on our, her, her live Instagram pot, uh, broadcast and talk to folks about the grief process. And through that, we have become tremendous friends but I love the fact, and she's gonna hate me right now for this, but she's a doctor. I have a friend who's a doctor. <laughs> but the thing that, the reason I wanna bring this up is that she's devoted her academic studies, her research, and her life to helping people and to understanding pet loss and how it affects people and how she can help alleviate, or at least help explain some of that suffering that we face. Because that's where she and I come together. I wanna know, what am I doing when I think this way? What happens when all of a sudden I see Christmas lights and I hear Christmas music and I break into tears? What is that? What is that moment that we call triggering or that moment where a certain sense will, a, a, a something we smell makes us all of a sudden crazy or we're crying in the middle of PetSmart because we found our dog's favorite toy. You know what I'm talking about. And they're no longer here with us. And so she is very humble and doesn't like to be called Dr. Katie. But I have to tell you, you've put the time in lady and we really want to hear from you. And so I'd like for you to welcome to the stage for me, my dear, dear friend, Dr. Katie Lawler. I hope it's, can you hear me? I hope it's okay if I read. Um, it's my first time here to Best Friends. And I just got here about a half an hour ago and I'm just very moved. Um, and, and touched in the, in the deepest way. So I'm so grateful to be gathered here with you all this afternoon on this beautiful and sacred land to honor the animals who have departed this physical world. Whether they were our loyal companions, our patients, or creatures that touched our hearts from afar, they taught us what it feels like to bond with another soul. And I've often thought about why we humans are so drawn to and why we love animals so much. And I wonder, is it because they teach us to live in the present moments of life's unpredictable journey? Is it because caring for them often involves putting their needs before our own, nurturing a more selfless, giving version of who we wanna be? Is it because they constantly forgive those who have let them down in the past with a trusting tail wag or a soft purr or a gentle nudge? Is it because their affection expands our hearts, showing us that love only makes us richer the more we give it away? Or is it because animals teach us to listen carefully, to patiently observe, and to respond with tenderness and respect? Though they may no longer physically be by our side, their spirits continue to surround us. And I hope we may find some solace in the understanding that they are now at peace, perhaps frolicking free from pain in vast meadows, basking in endless sunshine, or gazing over us from the skies above. May their memory remind us forever to value all living beings especially the most innocent and vulnerable amongst us. 
and let their legacy continue to guide our actions as we, tr as we strive to be better stewards of the natural world, ensuring that future generations can experience their existence with wonder. I hope we can go forth from this celebration of life, trusting that our departed animals are woven into the eternal tapestry. May we continue to support one another through the healing process, extending compassion to all of us who have experienced the void of a profound loss. And let the relationship we share as a community grow stronger, united by our dedication and devotion to saving animals. May their souls rest in endless peace. Thank you. And now we're going to hear from Josh, who's the manager of Angels Rest. All right, hello, everybody. So again, my name is Josh, and uh, we're here, or I'm here, to celebrate some of the people that have coworkers or staff that have walked on from this earth during this year. I have a few stories for you. Kathy Bosley was with Best Friends for over 15 years, including 13 and a half years as a cat caregiver. Kathy inhabited her passion for cats beyond measure. Seeing her husband, Randy, who worked for Best Friends for 12 and a half years, would eat their lunch in the catteries, occasionally sharing with the residents. She fostered hospice cats allowing them to enjoy their time left in a loving home. She was patient and loving with cats that needed both patience and love. Those of us who were on the receiving end of her endless generosity weren't surprised by the impact Kathy Bosley had on them and the impact she'll continue to have on every person, person and animal lucky enough to have known her. All of us who knew, her, who knew you will always miss you dearly, Bosley. But your spirit will always be here at Best Friends. You know, I was lucky enough and, and honored enough to have tucked in a number of her little family members at the Overlook, uh, especially. And she was always great telling stories about each one. And she would kind of lighten up. And of course, Randy would be there. And I, I, I loved them together because they were kind of opposites. And they would just kind of go back and forth on the stories. And if you knew them, you knew what, what I was talking about. But uh, uh, she will definitely be missed. Drew Alred was with Best Friends for about a year and a half, but his ties to the sanctuary were deep. Drew's partner works in cats, his sister works in horses, and his aunt and uncle are longtime Best Friends employees. So even though I didn't know Drew personally, there were plenty of people who knew him very well. He was kind and caring and loved working in the clinic. Even though his job didn't involve animal care, he was the first one to volunteer when help was needed. He especially loved hanging out with the dogs in the clinic to help calm them and make them feel safe in an environment that could be a little frightening. Drew loved science fiction, and he even wrote sci-fi, and I'm told that his writings were actually pretty good. He also loved doing beadwork and loved his pet rats. His gentle, unassuming kindness will truly be missed and my heart goes out to his partner, family, and friends. Shelly Ashbrocker Shelley started with Best Friends in 2010. Shelly's team members will be the first ones to say that she was the person who created a strong team culture within development operations. She was the warm and the fuzzy one who always remembered birthdays and the first one to congratulate people on work anniversaries or other milestones. She was also very positive, uplifting, and even when maybe she should have said no, she never did, to especially to a request for a team no matter what they needed. She was gracious, humble, kind, and loving. She celebrated all the good things in life and even saw the value in more challenging times because they gave you perspective. Shelly was so much of who we all aspire to be. Please keep her family, friends, and colleagues in your hearts. Oh. 
And I would also like to honor some of the pets of the attendees here in the audience. There was Lloyd, Ruthie, and Benny, Honey Bear, Abby, Miley, and Lucy, Sunshine, Gladys, and Hazel, Fuzzball, August, Dietz, Lily, Short Tail, Sasha, Smokey, Shiloh, Ebony, and Pavarotti, Abby, Bella, Kona Nalu, Lani Hoku, Tigger, Boots, Kai Lani, and another Tigger, Jack, Starla, Nelson, Moo, and Benny.
Now, at this point, I'd like to introduce Cyrus, one of our co-founders here at Best Friends. <laughs> Thank you all for being here. Now you can hear me, yes? Um, I'd like to lead us all in a meditation about pet grief, but sitting here thinking about um, the grief and the separation that we all feel when we lose one of our special friends, it made me think of a line from a Leonard Cohen song, uh, there's a crack in everything, that's how the light gets in. So sit comfortably, put your feet on the ground, and feel that connection with the earth. Close your eyes, and just allow your body to relax. Feel the relaxation in your feet and legs. Let your arms relax. Relax your fingers. Relax the muscles in your back, the lower back, the mid back, and the upper back. Relax your shoulders. Relax the muscles in your neck and throat area. Take a deep breath in through the nose and out through the mouth. Losing an animal companion is difficult. 
strong emotions arise. When we think about never seeing them again, we suffer. But we can keep them alive in our hearts by feeling their unconditional love. Right now, bring to mind a companion animal that you lost. And feel the love they gave to you, that unconditional love. Visualize this love coming to you as a stream of golden light coming from them into your heart. And bask in that love till you're overflowing with feelings of peace, security, and happiness. That's their gift to you. Now expand your awareness to include all people who may have recently lost a companion animal. And share this love you're feeling now with them. Send them feelings of love and security and peace and happiness. You can return to these feelings of love anytime. You can keep the memory of your lost companion in your heart through their unconditional love. Take a deep breath. And slowly open your eyes. Thank you. Now I'd like to invite back to the microphone my best friend, my wife, Anne. That's okay. You can take the mic away. Thanks, babe. Thanks, Dad. Just take, take the stand. Stand. stand away. All right. We're going to hold on to it. We've been married 50 years. I'm used to it. <laughs> so I want to say thank you to each and every one of you here for loving the ones that you have saved and cared for over the many years that you have brought them into your lives. You have transformed their lives, and I know they have changed you forever. I want to thank our incredible caregivers because they have cared for so many precious lives that have had so many challenges when they arrive here. And you meet them just like how every one of us have met our own animals with that very precious 
understanding where they are, what their needs are, how to enrich their lives, and how to make them feel safe. So I want to take a moment, and for all of us, to give a big hand to these incredible people. The love that these animals give us is so forever. What they give us stays with us in a deep place that I think no other love touches. And I think the best way we can honor their lives is to really expand that love in our own lives to the animals that we meet, whether it be one on the street or someone in a shelter or sending in support or volunteering as a foster person, whatever we can do, expand our love to so many other animals. But also, I'd like us all to expand our love to other people and to let them be an example to all of us about unconditional love and the way we are willing to meet them where they are, whatever their challenges are. Let's look to do that for people that we meet and understand we all struggle, we all suffer, and we all can be good to each other. The vision of best friends is a better world through kindness to animals. And I think that by changing the way society is relating to animals in this country is a huge movement that we are all a part of. And that coming together to do that is the gift the animals have given us. And the kindness that we give to them can expand to the kindness we give to each other. And I see that in each and every one of you, the kindness that you have shared in your stories, the way that you care for each other, the way that you have spoken about the staff that we have here today that care for the animals, the stories I've heard from you, and how you feel about how the staff care for the animals shows your, your incredible love and appreciation for them. And that is so important in our lives to really extend that and create a better world. We have some tribute cards that were sent in by many, many people around the country to honor the animals that have passed in their lives. And we're going to take those over to the fire that we're going to have in the pit over there and offer them up to the, the universe and let those tributes go out in a way that is lifted into the air and will be out there forever. So we'd like you to help when we complete here. And if you'd like to take any cards that are existing that Carol and Josh can help you with and help us take them to the fire and release them. And again, I wanna thank you so much for caring, for loving, for doing everything you do to make this a better world through kindness to animals. Thank you.